If you're suffering from IBS, you're not alone. IBS is actually very common. Millions of Americans have IBS, and it's estimated to affect 10 to 15% of the U.S. population. In fact, it's the second most common reason to miss work. Hi, I'm Dr. Xiao. I'm a gastroenterologist here at Kaiser Permanente. I'm here today to discuss some treatment strategies for IBS. Long-term studies have shown that IBS is not associated with any dangerous medical conditions, including gastrointestinal cancer. However, if you have any signs of bleeding, anemia, unintentional weight loss, especially after the age of 50, or if you have any family history of any gastrointestinal cancer, we ask that you please discuss this with your doctor. IBS is impacted by multiple factors, including food, psychosocial factors, microflora, nerve sensitivity, and motility. We know that certain foods, particularly foods that contain certain kinds of sugars, can either cause or worsen IBS symptoms. Psychosocial factors can play a role in worsening IBS. Patients who have stress, anxiety, or depression have a higher incidence of IBS symptoms. This is because our gut and intestines are tightly linked to our nervous system. Nerve sensitivity plays a significant role in how someone with IBS perceives their symptoms. A person with IBS is likely more sensitive to pain and discomfort than a person without IBS. This is because IBS patients have a higher level of what is called visceral hypersensitivity. Motility is also of, of concern. Motility is the speed at which the intestine moves our food through the digestive system. People with IBS can either have very rapid motility, leading to diarrhea, or slow motility, leading to constipation. Today's treatment options for IBS are directed toward these factors, constipation-predominant IBS and diarrhea-predominant IBS. Currently available treatments can be grouped into two categories. The first is lifestyle and dietary modifications, and the second are supplements and medications. Some of these are available over the counter, and others are available only by prescription. Let's discuss lifestyle and dietary changes. Making lifestyle changes, like managing stress and changing the way you eat, can help alleviate your IBS symptoms. Studies have shown the benefits of engaging in exercise, stress reduction, mindfulness, and getting more restful sleep. Here at Kaiser Permanente, we offer many classes on these topics. Please check with your local health education department and register for these classes. Currently, there are three diet strategies used to treat IBS. The first is the low FODMAP diet, and the second is the MNICE diet. Diets for IBS are individualized and can vary among patients. We recommend working closely with a dietitian. Usually, a four-week trial of a new diet should be sufficient to gauge your response. You can then slowly reintroduce foods after the trial and see what works best for you. We'll start with constipation predominant IBS or IBS-C. You have this type of IBS if you suffer from constipation and your symptoms are improved after a bowel movement. This tends to be the more common type of IBS that we see. The first line of treatment for IBS-C is the addition of a specific type of fiber called psyllium. Psyllium is a soluble fiber that is different than the insoluble fiber that we get from fruits and vegetables. It has been shown in randomized trials of adults and children with IBS-C to help with symptoms of gas, bloating, and constipation by promoting regular bowel movements. We believe it works partly because of the beneficial effects when our microflora, which are the bacteria in our gut, process this fiber. There was a recent study published that showed that psyllium was also beneficial in children with IBS type symptoms. Psyllium powder comes in many forms. A popular brand is Metamucil that comes in flavored powders and unflavored capsules. There are also many other generic brands which can be found in your local pharmacy or grocery store. We recommend using a higher dose than is suggested on the bottle, at least 10 grams per day at breakfast, and then again at lunch or dinner. This supplement is safe to take long term. Some patients report excess gas when using psyllium fiber. In this case, we recommend trying other fibers called Benefiber or Citrusil. In summary, 
Soluble fiber like psyllium is helpful when treating IBSC and it can improve symptoms of constipation, bloating, and abdominal pain. If you are still having difficulty evacuating your bowel movements despite using psyllium powder, we recommend a safe, gentle laxative called polyethylene glycol 350, known by its popular brand name, Miralax. It doesn't affect your heart or kidneys and it doesn't alter your fluid and electrolyte balance. It can be taken long term and it does not lead to dependence. It's so safe that pediatricians use it frequently in children. When using Miralax, take a capful and mix it in eight ounces of water. After it is ingested, it travels down the length of the intestine and draws fluid into your colon, allowing your stool to be more hydrated and easier for you to pass. There are many other laxatives available in pharmacies, but according to National Society guidelines, there is not good data to recommend any of these for long-term use. Currently, there are three FDA-approved medications for IBSC. They are called linaclotide, which the pharmaceutical company calls Linzess, Lubiprostone, or Emetiza, and Plecanotide, or Trulance. They work by increasing intestinal secretions, thereby making your stool looser and easier to pass. Their main side effects are diarrhea and nausea. Please consult your doctor before trying these medications. What we've discussed is a general approach and overview of treatment of IBSC. To review, we start with psyllium fiber at 10 grams per day. If the symptoms are persistent, we add a dose or two of Miralax. If you need immediate relief, then a stimulant laxative such as bisacodyl suppository can be used to stimulate a bowel movement on demand. We find that most patients can get relief with these two steps. If you're using psyllium fiber and a laxative are not effective, then a prescription medication may be needed. Here we will discuss the treatments for diarrhea predominant IBS or IBSD. If you have mild symptoms of IBSD, some patients have had success with a synthetic fiber called Fibercon. Fibercon binds up your stool to make it a more solid consistency. Probiotics are also used in the treatment of IBSD. Probiotics are good types of bacteria and yeast that are thought to be beneficial for your digestive tract by balancing out your microflora. There are many kinds of probiotics available today on the market which feature different strains of a microorganism called Lactobacillus, Bifidobacterium, and Saccharomyces. They go by many different names like Culturel, VSL3, Align, and Fluorostor. Generally, patients with IBS who take probiotics feel better and have fewer symptoms. Unfortunately, there is not enough published data to recommend one probiotic over another. Our recommendation is to pick one and then try it for about a month to see if you experience any improvement in your symptoms. There are two supplements that are available for IBSD. The first one is IB Guard, which is an encapsulated peppermint oil and has been shown to be helpful for patients whose predominant symptoms are bloating and cramping. Peppermint oil can relax smooth muscle fibers, easing your cramps and discomfort. The second, which is available in Europe, is called Iberogast. It is a collection of different herbs that can be useful for discomfort as well. For mild symptoms of diarrhea, an over-the-counter anti-diarrheal agent called Imodium may be beneficial to alleviate symptoms of frequent diarrhea. Sometimes we use tricyclic antidepressant medications which are only available by prescription. These are an older class of antidepressant medications which can help control the nerves that feed your intestine. This treatment goes back to the important relationship between your intestines and your nervous system. These prescriptions are usually taken at bedtime. They can reduce diarrhea and discomfort from IBS. Importantly, when we use these medications to treat IBS and not depression, we are able to use lower doses. These medications' main side effects are drowsiness and constipation. There are two medications which are specifically FDA approved for IBSD. The first is a safe, non-absorbable antibiotic called rifaximin. 
This antibiotic stays in your intestine and helps to control your microflora. In high quality studies, a 14 day course significantly relieved IBS symptoms. Some patients' symptoms recurred after the antibiotic was completed and additional courses were needed. Finally, the most recently approved IBSD medication is called eluxodiline or Viberzi. It has been shown to reduce IBSD symptoms in randomized trials. However, its main limitation is a lack of long-term data and the fact that it cannot be used in people with gallbladder problems. Let's move on to acid reflux and heartburn. While this is not part of the IBS syndrome, they often go hand in hand. The lining of the esophagus is very different from the lining of the stomach. It is very sensitive to refluxed acid and when exposed can trigger a pain response. Frequent exposure of acid can lead to inflammation and even ulcers. Our medical treatments for heartburn aim to remove the acid from the refluxed fluid so that the fluid is not caustic or injurious to the esophagus. There are two main classes of antacid medications for heartburn. One called H2 blockers and the other proton pump inhibitors, commonly called PPIs. These medications work by blocking acid secretion in the stomach. The PPIs, while stronger in removing the stomach acid and much more effective in treating heartburn, are associated with side effects. More recently, there have been studies published suggesting an association between long-term use of PPI medications and adverse events such as kidney problems or memory problems. However, the overall risk is still quite low and national guidelines still advocate the use of PPI medications when indicated. Our approach is to start with an H2 blocker and only stepping up to defined finite courses of PPI medications when needed. In addition, lifestyle modifications can be used in managing acid reflux. Changes such as elevating the head of the bed, avoiding eating right before sleeping, and avoiding trigger foods may be helpful. Thank you for taking the time to view this video. We hope that you found it informative and helpful. IBS is a common and treatable diagnosis. In this video, we have started to scratch the surface of this condition. Hopefully, you've gotten enough information to help you make an informed decision in treating your IBS. If you have any questions or want to discuss further, please contact your doctor. The information provided in this video is not intended to take the place of the professional medical care of your primary care provider and medical team. If you have new symptoms, or if your symptoms worsen, please contact your doctor. On behalf of everyone here at Kaiser Permanente, we wish you the best and look forward to continuing partnering with you and helping you to thrive.